This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, welcome to Living History and this week marks an anniversary that is very special in Australian folklore, it's the anniversary of the Eureka Stockade and I thought what better opportunity to sit down and discuss this chapter of Australian history that I think is one of those ones we feel we know inside and out, but in reality we probably don't know the details very well at all. So I'm joined uh, by Professor Frank Bongiorno from the Australian National University. Uh, Frank, thank you very much for joining us on the program. Thanks, Matt. A uh, pleasure. Eureka Stockade. It's uh, The legend is probably larger than the events themselves. Why don't we start? Give us the, the just the, the, the overview of what this was, why it occurred, what, what was actually going on at this time. So, yeah, Eureka Stockade was really a rebellion or an uprising of miners at Ballarat uh, in 1854, really November, December 1854. Um, it uh, resulted in the deaths of probably, we don't know the exact numbers, but probably about 30 miners um, and, and many more were wounded and injured. Um, and a number of soldiers, again, I think four or five is usually the number given. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's, I guess, one of the rare um, instances that we have in the, the sort of white history, the settler history of Australia, of that kind of civil violence. Um, you know, and that's really one of the ways in which it's often been understood as, as a kind of um, you know, uh, in some ways a departure from the relatively peaceful way in which um, civil life had, had been, you know, sort of lived by the settler society in Australia. Um, of course, we know that Australia has a lot of violence in its history, but certainly historically that's the way in which the Eureka Stockade was, was understood. The motivations for it, again, these are kind of contested as so many historical questions are. Um, at the heart of it was taxation, which um, you know can still excite people today, I guess. Um, so miners needed a, li a, a license to um, to dig for gold. They they were in Victoria, colonial Victoria. It was normally about two and a half metres square was a claim. And the, the going rate for licences shifted. But by the time of the Eureka Stockade, it was about a pound a month. So that was quite a lot of money in, in those days. I mean, a pound was probably what a, a labourer would be paid, I guess, um, you know, relatively unskilled labourer. So it's, it was a substantial amount of money. And of course, if you didn't find gold, it turned out to be a very expensive exercise. And one of the things about Ballarat is that it was called deep, le le deep lead mining. And it was often difficult to find gold. There was an immense amount of chance involved and so if you'd paid out for a license and you know you didn't find anything that was you know obviously quite an, an imposition but there are other issues involved too goldfields corruption the way in which the police operated the lack of political rights I mean this was really before we had democracy in Australia it really came at the end of that decade partly as a result I suppose of Eureka um, and you know, even things like you know the demand or desire for land. So there were a lot of other things sort of lying behind the rebellion. But fundamentally, it was about um, the issue of taxation and 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 how much gold miners had to pay in in order to have the right to dig for gold. It was a fairly tumultuous period around the world, wasn't it? The sort of mid nineteenth century. I mean, we're, we're talking about we're talking about the decade before the American Civil War, and th there were movements about civil rights and 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 where people fitted into society. It really was. I mean, often when we look back, I think, on the colonial history of Australia, we think that it was all started to settle down a bit by this stage. But that sort of mid-19th century was really quite a tumultuous time, wasn't it, in Australia? It was pretty turbulent internationally, as you say. I mean, 1848 is often called the Year of Revolution. So there were revolutions really right through certainly continental Europe. And Britain, of course, had the Chartist movement in that era, which was a working class movement for um, political rights. And, you know, it had a peaceful wing, a moral force wing, but it also also had a what they called a physical force wing. So revolutionary ideas, you know, were also around in Britain at that time. And yeah, many of the the gold rush generation of of, of, of migrants of the early 1850s who came to dig for gold in Australia or to set up businesses had been exposed to those radical ideas in in Britain and Europe. Others had been in the United States where they'd you know, come into contact with uh, Republican ideas. Some had dug for gold on the West Coast in the, 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 you know, the famous gold rush in San Francisco in that, in that period. So, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty um, turbulent time internationally. And, 
you know, we, we get a sense of, of Australia, and particularly Victoria, which was the main centre for, for, you know, only recently separated from New South Wales, and you get a sense of it as a pretty cosmopolitan sort of society in which, you know, there are a lot of quite radical ideas floating around during that period. So, yeah, this was, I mean, it's it's a broadly peaceful community, I think, in a lot of ways, but it's certainly one that's, you know, it's pretty turbulent. And you can just imagine, you know, a, a relatively uh, small, young city like Melbourne and Geelong too where you know these migrants were coming in they pre- they could be pretty disorderly places and of course you know disproportionately male and disproportionately young male populations coming in too and you know as today we know the, the kinds of results that you know lots of alcohol floating about lots of gambling all that sort of thing so you know you're right I mean pretty turbulent period it seems a time as well when a lot of those societal changes that we would see over the next 50 or so years were starting to clash migration race issues the end of slavery in america the role of women and their rights um suffrage there was just a whole host of societal changes that would fester and grow over the, the coming decades were really beginning to, to take hold at this time. And from my readings of the Eureka Stockade, that uh, there's so many elements of that that come together. There's race issues, there's migration, there's taxation, there's representation, there's the right to vote. Just about everything was all sort of coming together. I, it, it seems to me that just about every person that was there had a sort of a different reason for being there. They all said it was about taxation, representation, but there's so many agendas floating around to do with the, uh, the the rebellion. Is that a fair assessment? Oh, it is. I mean, I think most most people there wanted to strike it rich. I mean, you know, this was very much about, about um, you know, uh, making a living, uh, a bit like the lottery, I suppose, the idea that you could you could go and, 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 and really strike it lucky and that it would set you up for life. Um, you know, this is the period before a welfare state. Uh, it's a period where, you know, people had to, I guess, think about it. You know, what am I going to do if I live too old? age you know how am I going to support myself and the notion of independence is really important um, yeah in, independence of course could sometimes have um, national implications you know idea of being you know sort of an independent nation but the notion of personal independence is very powerful I think in this period and um, wealth was seen as giving you independence it meant that you wouldn't be dependent on a master an employer and and I think gold you know needs to be understood in that kind of context it was seen as a way to kind of, um, you know, to a, a, a sense of individual autonomy that you would never be able to achieve while you were working for a master, as they called their employers at the time. One of the, the core themes of the rebellion that became the, the Battle of the Eureka Stockade seems to be this this notion of um, the the fees paid for the, the permits for the mines was a form of tax. And this whole notion, which we see in America very much at the time of the revolution, is taxation without representation is tyranny and all this yes. whole thing, which is ludicrous when you think about it, that most people in the world at this time paid a lot of tax and had zero rights to to vote or take part in the processes that determined their life. Um, yet it was a, a, an absolute battle cry, wasn't it, of people at this time that, that as you say, independence, self-representation, individual rights, it was really um, a bit of a powder keg, wasn't it? It was. It's, it's, of course, a form of direct taxation. So most taxation that people paid, you know, in, in, in that era was indirect. It would be you know, for instance, a tariff on an imported product or something. So you kind of didn't see it, whereas you you couldn't miss the fact that you had to go out and buy this license. And if you're caught without the license, if you're caught digging gold without the license, you were subject to punishment. Um, there was a lot of complaints, uh, or there were a lot of complaints about the ways in which the law was enforced, you know, very aggressive police on the Ballarat fields, the the the, the um, digging was often a long way down, and so you know if a if a policeman sort of appeared at the top of the mine, you know it was a, a great inconvenience to have to sort of go up and show them, you know, show some surly policeman, you know, your your license. So it was a very it was a direct form of of taxation which was seen as particularly obnoxious, I think. And look. They're very influenced by, um, you know, the, the the kinds of revolutionary ideas associated with the United States in that period. Taxation without representation is a term that's used by these these diggers, and not just Americans, but those who are, you know, simply influenced by those kinds of those more democratic ideas that are becoming really powerful in the English speaking world. For instance, in the eighteen thirties and forties, 
particularly via Chartism in, in Britain. I mean, that's the great movement of the era. And, you know, it has a whole Australian history that's barely been told in a lot of ways. You know, when you look at the program of, say, the Ballarat Reform League, which is, you know, one of the key organisation that's agitating on, on the goldfields, it's indistinguishable from the kinds of ideas that were being pushed by the Chartists in Britain in the 1830s and 40s. We should also remember as well, this is only 25 years or so before Ned Kelly was roaming around doing his thing and, and, and being the poster child for the police state that was oppressing the working man. So there was very much of this sort of thing going on. We should talk specifically about what actually happened. So you've got these miners who are disenfranchised with the, the whole system and feel they're getting ripped off because they have to pay these fees. So what did they decide to do about it? Yeah. So, you know, these kinds of um, events inevitably have local triggers and, and a number of things happened on the Ballarat fields in the weeks leading up to the 3rd of December that, that acted as triggers. Um, uh, for instance, you know, outside uh, one of the, the hotels, the Eureka Hotel, um, there was the, 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 the killing of a particular you know, quite popular local, a Scottish man um, called uh, a Scobie, James Scobie. And, uh, you know, th this happened um, outside a pub that was the, the pub where the police went, essentially. So it was considered the police pub. And suspicion very soon fell on the pub owner and his wife. Um, their names were James, uh, um, Kath James and Catherine Bentley. And, um, you know, they were seen as, as corrupt and eventually, um, you know, they're, they're tried um, but they're, they're let off effectively and this is seen as further evidence of, of corruption. And uh, the miners on one occasion, October 1854, burnt the hotel down um, and, uh, you know, uh, it was fortunate no one was actually killed in it. So th this was a major episode leading up to, to, to Eureka. I mean, it, it obviously led to punishment of some of those who were responsible for the burning down of the hotel. But it, it, it's, I guess, placed in the spotlight the whole issue of corruption, the sense that not everyone was equal before the law on the Ballarat fields, um, you know, the, the, the fact that uh, a, a man had been murdered and uh, two people who were regarded as favourites of the of the police had sort of been, um, you know, effectively got off. Um, and, uh, you know, th so this is very much a part of the background to to the um, the, the uprising. And, and so you, you get to a situation by the middle of, of November where there's, a, a, you know, a, an increasing ascendancy of those who are kind of physical force advocates, those who are arguing that the miners should actually take up arms to resist the authorities. You had another wing um, represented by, particularly by a man named J.B. J. Humphrey, who would eventually... Um, you know, become member of the parliament and so on, uh, who, you know, advocated moral force, you know. So there was, uh, there were different strategies and understandings of what should be done, but a sense that something had to be done was very widely, um, very, very widely held by November of, uh, of 1854. Do you think the miners were justified in their feeling that they were being oppressed by the police and, and fairly poorly done by? Y yeah, but in a sense they were. I mean, um, we, we can sort of read this in a way via the solutions that eventually came out of, 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 of the episode. And uh, instead of a, a, a licence tax, um, a, 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 essentially you had a, um, a, a tax on the export of gold. Now, that was being resisted in the lead up to Eureka because... Um, a, a tax on gold exports, uh, you know, uh, undermine the position of the wealthiest people in Victoria, those who controlled the Legislative Council, this undemocratic, you know, sort of political chamber that existed before the move towards democracy. So, you know, the, 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 there were genuine grievances, um, certainly around the issue of taxation. It was a system of taxation that paid no attention to one's income. That is, you, you're a successful miner you paid the same amount as someone who, who found nothing. And as gold became harder to come by, and, and that was certainly the case in Ballarat by 1854, you know, this emerges as a, as a grievance. And there's no doubt that, you know, um, there was plenty of police corruption. Um, many of the, uh, you know, police were, uh, for instance, former convicts. So some had come across from Van Diemen's land, what's now Tasmania. And so there was there was a sense that Goldfield's administration was rather um, rather poor, basically, that it was it was pretty it was inefficient, that it was corrupt. There was a lack of responsiveness um, of authorities uh, in Melbourne to the grievances of the of the diggers. So they certainly had you know legitimate grievances. It wasn't just cooked up um, as an excuse for for, for violence. Yeah. So we've got these aggrieved miners who are now um, 
lobbying for some more uh, some some more action than than previously occurred. What what led to this famous the famous stockade? Tell us about the battle that, that actually yeah. unfolded. Yeah. So the man who emerges as the leader, I guess, of those who were prepared to 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 use physical force was a an Irishman named, named Peter Lawler. Um, and, you know, he clearly commanded considerable um, moral authority. Um, his brother had been a very famous revolutionary back in, in Ireland in, in the 1840s, for instance. We should mention yeah. as well that there was a very strong Irish connection to this, wasn't oh, there? Yeah. So a lot of the uh, key players in this had a, that, that fiery Irish background, didn't they? Very much so. And, and Ireland was one of those nations that was in turmoil in 1848 too, you know. So... Um, Lawler comes out of that tradition, really. Um, you know, he's a rebellious sort of character, and he emerges somewhat reluctantly as as the leader of the more, I suppose, the physical force wing, if you like, of of, of the the diggers reform movement. We should keep in mind too, there's like a reform movement right through Victoria on all of the fields, and, and in fact, you know, probably up to. Maybe mid 1854, Bendigo looked a lot most likely prospect. It was a much more turbulent place and a much more rebellious place than Ballarat had been. Um, but for, for various local reasons, particularly I think the difficulty of mining at Ballarat, perhaps the Irish influence as well, Ballarat does emerge as, as the place where this happens, the, the level of corruption there. Um, and, yeah, so uh, Lawler basically emerges. He um, uh, calls on uh, fellow miners to, 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 you know, pledge their loyalty under the Southern Cross, to stand by one another, to resist authorities, to defend their rights. So there's a very dramatic um, uh, ceremony of that kind just a few days before um, they go into the stockade. Then they build this this stockade. They called it a stockade. It was essentially a, a rather, um, you know, fairly poorly constructed enclosure that, um, uh, you know, had women and children in it. So it wasn't just a bunch of men kind of holed up. Um, it was much more diverse. Now. It was effectively a, a substantial part of the field where a lot of people were camped, where there were businesses operating, for instance, and uh, they go in there, uh, you know, essentially right at the end of November, and it's it's um, you know full of of, of people, um, and uh, they're determined to resist. And of course, the authorities are increasingly concerned about this and and, and about what to do about it. Um, they increasingly resolved uh, that they they're basically going to break this up and to to find an opportunity to do that. Um, the governor had only really just come to office, a man named Governor Hotham. And uh, he was, you know, he had visited the gold fields, but um, had clearly underestimated, I think, the, the level of dissatisfaction um, on the fields with gold fields administration. And um, and so they, they occupy, they've armed themselves, they, they occupy this particular uh, area. Um, but then on um, the, the Saturday evening, as often happened on gold fields on Saturday evenings, there was a lot of carousing, a lot of drunkenness and all the rest of it, a, a lot of partying, uh, and uh, a, a lot of men had actually left the the, uh, the stockade overnight on Saturday night and Sunday morning, had gone back to their tents at, on other parts of the field. And so only a relatively limited number of, of um, men and, and some women and children were in the stockade um, early on the morning of the Sunday, the 3rd of December, and that's when the authorities, who clearly you know, had intelligence, they had information coming, no doubt through spies and others, um, uh, they decided to, to attack at that at that time. So they approached the, the stockade and I think within, you know, when there's about 150 yards, 150 metres to go, the, the shooting begins. No one quite knows who shot first. Each side claimed the other shot first. But, you know, it, it, it led to a, a very bloody massacre. Um, uh, well, first a confrontation between the two sides, which... Um, the, the diggers had very little chance of winning. They were you know, very poorly armed compared to, to the soldiers um, and uh, um, were quickly overcome. They took about 15 minutes, so it wasn't a, a terribly extended um, uh, event. Um, and then it was followed by, you know, quite a dreadful massacre, actually, where wounded men were bayoneted, uh, where there was shooting at, at, at women and children, uh, there was the breaking up of tents, eventually the, the burning of tents. Um, so th there was a, a lot of exposure after this um, of, you know, uh, very bad behaviour on the part of troops who, um, as, as has often happened in, in kind of battlefield situations, kind of went berserk really. And that certainly affected public opinion afterwards, which was, you know, very favourable to the diggers and, and very hostile to the government 
and the Goldfields administration and the soldiers. We should remember as well too, these were genuine soldiers, weren't they? They oh, were yes. It wasn't a, yeah. a police constabulary no. thrown together. These were a lot of them British soldiers, I believe, yeah. as well, who were yeah. brought in, and these were properly trained, Absolutely. properly armed yeah. military soldiers. Yeah. So it yeah. was always going to be a one-sided affair. Absolutely, and particularly given the very small numbers of men who were in the stockade You know, by the time they attacked at dawn on the, the 3rd of December. I was reading in the statistics that, as you say, that we're not quite sure how many people died, but regardless, we know there's a very high proportion of the casualties were killed um, compared to the number of wounded people. Um, you know, if you look, normally look at a battle on a, on a yeah. battlefield, you'd say that maybe a quarter or a third were killed of the total casualties. Right. But here, it was the, the the majority of people yeah. that were wounded in the in the yeah. conflict were killed, yeah. which does suggest again a, 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 an overstepping of the mark yeah. by the soldiers. And yeah, a, a, well, people a, talked of it as a massacre. There was a lot of eyewitness um, yeah. uh, testimony to this being a massacre. There's a very moving account of it in John Maloney's classic book on Eureka, which. Um, came out, I think, about 1984, many years ago. But there's a chapter in it where he, he recounts how you know, he talks about this and it's a, you know, it was a, a dreadful massacre afterwards, yeah. Is it true that they the the, uh, the miners fought under the uh, the famous blue and white Southern Cross flag? Is that is that accurate? They did, yes. Um, so there were a lot of flags on, on the gold fields. It was a place where there were flags everywhere. Um, and, you know, I guess a lot of... Um, um, Legend is attached, hasn't it, to the, the 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 image of the of the Southern Cross? Um, it was uh, very likely put together by women. So one of the things we've learnt much more about, I think, in recent years, is the involvement of of women in the goldfields reform movement, and 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 that they were there on the, on that Sunday morning. That women were involved in in the events that we've been we've been talking about. You know, they did have atrocities committed against them. You know, there were. Um, uh, you know, w- women who were, sh- as I said, who were shot at and attacked. Um, there, there have always been hints too that some may 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 have been sexually molested in the aftermath as these soldiers went berserk. So there are, you know, the, the sources are, are ambiguous on this, but they at least hint at it. Some of the eyewitness accounts. Um, so yeah, w- w- women were in, involved in in um, various ways, but um, certainly. Uh, in making the, the famous flag that, that, of course, has survived and is in, in still in Ballarat. Um, and that, yeah, very much has become a symbol subsequently of, I guess, Australian independence, republicanism. It's been used by virtually every part of the political spectrum, left, right and centre at one time or another. It's, it's very popular as a symbol in Ballarat too. I mean, it remains a, 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 a dominant image of that city and you see it everywhere. I think it's the symbol of the local the local you know, council and, and that sort of thing as well. We, we had it here in, in 2004 here in Canberra. The, uh, um, John Howard wasn't very enthusiastic about doing anything about the 150th anniversary of, of Eureka, but uh, the Labor government of the time led by John Stanhope decided they'd have Eureka flags all the way up Commonwealth Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> And so it adorned this city as well at the time of the 150th back in 2004. What was the aftermath of the rebellion? What uh, what direct reforms did it lead to? What were the, the survivors? Were they punished? Were the the soldiers? Were they punished for their role in the massacre? What what were the immediate outcomes of the of the of the rebellion? Yeah, so there's a, a, a court trial of about a, do- a dozen um, of the rebels, um, and they were all um, found not guilty. Um, so. Uh, you know that in some ways reflected. You know these are jury trials. It reflected, I think, the the state of public opinion at the time, which turned drastically uh, in favour of the of the diggers, um, particularly in the aftermath of this. And as I think there was exposure of a sense of lack of restraint and lack of judgment on the part of authority soldiers and so on. Um, at, at least one of the 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 those who was charged was. Um, uh, a, a black man, probably an African American, possibly a, a, from the Caribbean, which is quite interesting. I think it, it shows again. I think the cosmopolitanism of of, of this. Um, I don't think anyone's found a Chinese miner involved. Um, the Chinese were coming into Victoria to dig for gold by this time, um, but you know it, it is a very um, international group who were tried, which reflects the the, the the nature of the goldfields movement. They're not just English speakers. They're not just British. Um, and yes, they were all you know to, to much acclaim in Melbourne were found were found not guilty. Some of the other things that that changed so the, the license was abolished and replaced by a miner's right, which was much cheaper. Um, uh, you know, basically it, it allowed you to dig for gold over a full year for a much more modest uh, um, amount, and it also came with a vote. 
So, you know, the, the miners' right had attached to it the right to vote. And that does, you know, provide some of the background to the, the development of a democracy in Victoria. And by the time you get to the end of the 1850s, most of South Eastern Australia have recognisably democratic forms of government. Not, not yet women, that would come later, but certainly male suffrage, um, votes for men. Um, and... More, more generally, it, it leads to, I guess, a, a kind of radicalisation of the of the political system. So, you know, you've got a in 1854. This was a, a a government. This was a political system that was, you know, utterly dominated by the old squatting class. You know, those who owned the the large landholders, the the importers, the exporters, including exporters of gold, um, the official class. You know, those who were essentially. Uh, being paid by the British government in one form or another to perform official roles, and that shifts drastically. I mean, this becomes a Victoria became a, a radically democratic community for its for its day, and uh, you know the, the continuing waves of migration, um, you know, during the eighteen fifties and, and early eighteen sixties contributed to that. I mean, this is a, um, a, a a community that's growing in size incredibly rapidly. I mean, Melbourne was only twenty three thousand people. On the eve of the gold rush, um, and it's what well over a hundred thousand by the time you get to the about one hundred and twenty five, I think, by the time you get to the end of the eighteen fifties. And Victoria itself has a population of over half a million. This is the, the settler population at the time. Um, so it, it, it's growing, you know, really quickly. And of course, much of that population, unlike today, is outside of Melbourne, so it's distributed through through the gold fields. It's an upcountry population. Which is something, of course, that that has um, not happened. I mean, you know, very unusual experience for Australia in a lot of ways to have so much of the population essentially living in that that hinterland. So, some really interesting things happening around the gold rushes of the period and the turbulence of of Eureka and and just more generally, I think that the the, the turbulence of um, a, a, a society and a political system that's you know, kind of in, in a very formative and fluid state. And that's really what you have in the 1850s. And there was a perception immediately after the rebellion that it was responsible for the, for, for many of these changes, directly responsible. I think I think it was Mark Twain was travelling in Australia yeah. soon afterwards and he said that it was a great victory was won from the lost yeah. battle. Yeah. Is that fair to say that the that this bunch of ragtag miners on a hill in Ballarat led directly to these great changes? Yeah, I think it's probably exaggerated. Um uh, you know, clearly it did give a boost to dem- the democratic movement in Victoria. So but by the time Eureka happens, there are draft constitutions for, for Victoria, for New South Wales, uh, for, for South Australia, um, uh, not yet for Queensland, which would separate later. Um, and, and they were pretty undemocratic, you know, so they, they, they weren't particularly, um, um, you know, um, democratic political systems that were envisaged at that time. But there's no doubt the combination of Eureka, the combina- combination of um, a, a radical goldfields movement that wasn't just confined to Victoria. You get some of that in New South Wales as well. That pushed things along and it and it, it, it strengthened the claims um, of those who wanted a more democratic system. And I think that manoeuvre of attaching the right to vote to um, the, the, the right to dig for gold, which comes out that that is a very direct result of Eureka, um, does give it an enormous boost to democracy or to manhood suffrage anyway. Once you've conceded that a miner um, has the right to vote because they've effectively purchased, um, you know, very cheaply the right to, to dig for gold, you're not going to really deny it to craftsmen sitting in Melbourne or to farmers. So, you know, it, it, it does boost, certainly in Victoria, it boosts the democratic movement. That does have some flow on to other I mean, Victoria is by far the most dynamic of the colonies in this period. New South Wales and Sydney seemed rather sleepy by comparison. Yeah. Of course, Melbourne and Victoria would become the most populous part of Australia for decades. You know, really, it was what probably the late eighteen nineties before Sydney overtook Melbourne again as the largest city. I suppose that the fact that miners were prepared to fight and die for what they believed in really clarified what was a fairly broad movement, wasn't it? That you had this situation where the authorities knew miners were unhappy yeah. and it it solidified that in a very clear way when a bunch of them were, were prepared to lay their lives on the line. Yeah, well, the notion it. of blood sacrifice is central to the revolutionary tradition of that era coming out of um, the, the American Revolution, the French Revolution. Um, uh, it, it's also seen as the foundation of nationhood. 
you know, the idea that you couldn't have a real nation until someone had shed blood in sacrifice for it. Um, you know, and, and again, that's very prominent ideas in, in the American Revolution, French Revolution, 19th century European nationalisms. And, and you know, that, that, what we're getting at Eureka is, is kind of this idea in, a, in miniature, you know, so it's obviously a, a small scale uh, conflict in comparison with those big ones. But, it, you know, it, it drew on that, that idea that, that you know, you, you didn't have a real nation, that you, you, you didn't have um, a democracy or a political system that was worth... Um, you know, uh, defending until someone had shed blood for it. I well, we see that, we yeah. see it the same yeah. with Gallipoli. We, yeah. we, no yeah. one, no one gets really excited about 1901 when Australia was federated and became yeah. a country. Everyone exactly. gets excited about Gallipoli. And as a side note, there's an interesting Gallipoli mm. connection because Lawler's grandson served and was killed on the first killed day of Gallipoli. And, right. and the, the 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 legend is he was carrying mm. his grandfather's the sword, sword that he'd sword, used yeah. at Eureka. There's a connection. Um, yeah. So I, I, very I, similar ideas. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the it's yeah. this idea yeah. that that we yeah. weren't born as a nation yeah. until men had shed their blood. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, well, let's let's talk about what Eureka means because I, I think the legend of Eureka is is far greater than than the sum of its parts. It, it, was, it was not that many people involved. As you say, it only lasted for 10 or 15 minutes. Yeah. It was very one-sided. The authorities steamrolled over the, yeah. the, the rebels. Why has it struck such a chord? Why, you know, 165 years or whatever it is later, are we sitting here talking about it still? That's, yeah, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I think traditionally it, was, it seemed such an unusual um, uh, event in, in certainly settler history anyway, given it, you know, it was kind of, this is, Australia's often thought of itself as a country that that hadn't had battles on its soil. Now, that's been rightly challenged by the fact that we we now understand much more the frontier wars, that this was a form of effectively military conflict between Indigenous people and settlers. But I think, you know, historically, you know, Eureka was seen as as unusual in, 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 in the fact that it seemed to be a kind of European style or perhaps North American style um, struggle on 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 Australian on Australian soil, um, but yeah, I mean, its timing is critical, isn't it? The fact that it occurs in that period when you know these um, political systems are coming in into being, and so it became easy, I think, for people to see the societies a relatively relatively peaceful, you know, sort of urbanised kind of societies you get in Sydney and Melbourne and so on in the second half of the nineteenth century to to see them as somehow a product of that kind of um, rupture, that that kind of fracturing of 1854. So that happened, and now look what we have. You know, and you have this great myth of pioneering progress that is so important to how colonists see Australia in the second half of the of the 19th century. And I think Eureka is seen as as kind of foundational in in that. But it, it, it's it's been used. I mean, it's been incredibly versatile kind of ledge. You could put it to all. You know, so many different kinds of work. If you were, you know, an anti-British Republican type, it was obvious that you know it had it had utility. You know, the Irish rebel tradition and all the rest of it. Um, if you were someone who thinks that taxes are too high, you could put it to work for that. Um, if you were, you know, a, a fascist or you know some sort of character like that out of the right who you know thought that. Uh, um, you know, we, we needed to take Australia to take control of its own destiny and maybe keep out migrants or something. You'd put it to work for that as well because, you know, it was all about independence and uh, people, you know, uh, mainly white people, not all. We know that this is, myth, you know, there were actually others involved, but white people standing up for their rights. So different groups were able to put it to work for, for kind of different sorts of purposes. And really. that's, that's yeah. continued to today. Everyone from yeah. the both extreme ends of the political yeah. spectrum... Yeah. Embrace Eureka. You get the the trade union movement on the far left using the flag, famously, yes. and then you get neo Nazis oh, yeah, saying right. oh, use, yeah. using it as well, saying exactly the same thing that this was yeah. white men taking control yeah. and putting a whole racial element on it. Yeah. There, yeah. There's something which I can't quite get my head around that just speaks to everyone. A- again, the other example I would use is perhaps Ned Kelly as well. Yeah. That the the myth and the and and what we take away from it in the 21st century is much greater than perhaps the ingredients that went into the historic event in the first place. It's absolutely oh, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 most illustrious career has been after eighteen fifty four, not in 1854, I guess. Yeah. Um and, and look, it's also been pushed along. I mean, Ballarat has always been very important, I think, to the you know, the kind of fostering of this as an important or foundational moment in Australian history. Um uh, so, you know, I think that local dimension shouldn't 
um, be neglected. There've been periods where there's been limited national interest in it, but it's it's maintained a, a local presence in 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 Ballarat. It's probably more Victorian, I think, than anything else. So it it means more, I think, in for obvious reasons in Victoria than outside it. But yeah, I mean, I associate that the, the flag you tended to see it most commonly when I was growing up on the T-shirt of a member of the Builders' Labourers' Federation, which was, of course, the most uh, notoriously militant union of, of that day. So it's it's taken on some, yeah, some quite extraordinary associations. Politicians sometimes seem quite comfortable, as you know, an example I mentioned before, in celebrating it, and yet it, it, it has also been used by political extremes. The Communist Party's youth wing was called the Eureka Youth Movement back in the, you know, the mid uh, or the 1940s, for instance, in Australia, um, and and it's as you say, it's been used by the the far right as well. Is it time for a reinterpretation of Eureka? Should we should we assess what it means to us and 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 rethink it for, for what it means to Australia? Yeah, so I mean, there's been some rethinking of. I mean, the most influential sort of um, rethinking of it's come from Claire Wright, um, who who wrote a a book came out a few years ago, really drawing it. T- this is a legend that had often been seen. It's a very masculine one. You know, it's about men standing up for their rights. The the heroes of it are figures like Peter Lawler. But what she showed is that women were 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 involved in 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 the movement. They were they were there at Eureka on that Sunday morning. Um, that that you know they'd kind of been written out of the story, perhaps because that revolutionary nationalist tradition that we were talking about is a very male one. And, you know, it, it celebrates the sacri- the blood sacrifice of men. It celebrates the struggles of men. And women are seen to be marginal to that, but in fact, they're there. And and I think that's been the really most influential and powerful interpretation of recent years. That, you know, in some ways, this is a more genuinely democratic legend than anyone realised because it involved men and women. It, it, it wasn't just about men. That 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 you know, women were also agitating for 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 popular rights as well. You know, perhaps not the vote. Um, at, at that stage, you know, that was a perhaps a, a, a pretty marginal concern uh, in, in colonial society would become more important in the years ahead. But certainly the idea of popular rights were very strong amongst both men and women in, in you know, Victoria in the 1850s. So um, are there other ways this could be rewritten? Who, who knows? I mean, perhaps we'll We'll come to learn more about the the. I mean, it, it's it's interesting that in the nineteen seventies, the multicultural dimensions of it were emphasised. So again, that kind of chameleon character, the way in which the the legend shifts according to to changing circumstances. So, um, you know, we we can be certain that the changes that occur in the future will will be about what people need at that particular time. So I don't know. Um, you know, probably in the era of Me Too, it was maybe inevitable that people would take another look. Someone like Claire, and there are others doing this too, would take another look at Eureka and, and say, well, where are the women? Oh, there they are. They're everywhere. Um, and, and, and so, yes, perhaps we'll see other different type, types of changes in the future as our our sensibilities, our preoccupations and our needs change. Well, Frank, it's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for uh, giving your time to discuss this because it's, it's, it's an important chapter of Australian history and it's important we keep asking questions about it. So thank you very much for joining us to discuss it. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Matt.